Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the first lecture on multi-rate signal processing. So right here in the beginning, you see actually a nice application of multi-rate signal processing um, as part of the video coding here. I'm using Open Broadcaster software, OBS, for recording this lecture. So this is a um, nice open source tool and um, yeah, so if you want to try it yourself, go ahead. So let me close this. So first some announcement for the summer semester. So the lecture would usually be uh, Wednesdays from 9 to 10.30 in the Humboldt Bau, but um, since uh, we have the corona restrictions, it's probably mostly online. The seminars uh, will be from 9 to 10.30 in Helmholtzbau 1520A on the even weeks, bi-weekly. And starting uh, May, um, we will have meetings of small groups in this uh, seminar room. So groups consisting of a uh, maximum of three people and um, Oleg Gol Golokolenko, who um, will take care of the seminars, will organize time slots for each group to individually meet there but um, see the Moodle announcement from him for more details. Yeah, so also those of you who might be uh, not in Ilmenau, this could also be done uh, via video. Yeah, and um, the material, our lecture slides and the videos um, are on our websites. Um, so one is uh, the first one, which contains um, our old uh, slides, uh, but which is available on the outside website. So this contains the slides except for the semester. And then our Moodle 2 website um, contains the most up-to-date slides. And this is also intended for announcements. Uh, we have um, a forum where we can post announcements and that's also where you can post questions or messages or answers. So it's very practical for communications. Yeah, and this also contains the newest slides and weekly quiz assignments, um, basically short questions to the past mm -hmm. lecture. And uh, this also will give you points if you answer them correctly. And this needs to be done individually. Right, so it's usually you compute something and then you enter the number and then if it's correct, you get a point. Also, there will be bi-weekly homework assignments and those assignments count 30% towards the final grade. And the quizzes are part of the homework and will count as 25% of the homework. And to pass the course, you also need to pass the final exam. So it's not possible to just do it with the homework. So we have Python homeworks, uh, which can be done in groups of maximum three people, as I just mentioned. And I guess most of you are already familiar with um, Python. The course has a total of five credit points, and each credit point means about two to three hours work per week, which means we have 10 to 15 hours total per week or about 20 hours for two weeks, which is a homework cycle. So this shows that um, you can calculate about a whole a full day per a work day per week for um, the lecture and the homeworks. And we will use the system Moodle 2 for, as I mentioned, information exchange and also our quiz assignments. Here again the link and you need to sign up for it. So if you have a TO Ilmenau email address, um, then um, it should be straightforward to um, sign up. Um, if not, maybe this semester there will be an alternative. Yeah, so we also have prerequisites since it's an advanced course. So I assume that everybody um, is on the level of Advanced Digital Signal Processing, or DSP2, which was going on last semester, or something similar, or corresponding knowledge. So 
This is basically what, uh, what I assume because I have more advanced concepts here which I teach which needs this knowledge of ADSP. Yeah, so I assume um, most of you are familiar with Python and so we are also using it here in the lecture. I use it for examples and we use it for homework assignments. And it's, um, turns out to be very practical and suitable because it contains high level capabilities like MATLAB and Octave, but it's also a full-fledged programming language like C with many more capabilities and libraries, for instance, uh, for uh, video access. It is open source and hence free to download and use. It can be installed under Windows, but under Linux it is already installed and additional libraries are more easily installed under Linux. In general, programming is much easier under Linux because that is an operating system made for scientists, engineers, and programmers, unlike Windows, which is made for office applications, like writing letters, for instance. So for these reasons, Python and Linux are also used primarily for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So if you go into machine learning or artificial intelligence, uh, the tools there are mostly Python and Linux. And I will also um, give you a little introduction or some topics of it in the end of this lecture series. Yeah, so that's uh, why we will use Linux and only support Linux. So everybody should have it on your, their computers. So Linux is also open source and can be freely downloaded and used, unlike Windows, which is closed source and costs about 100 euros per copy. And Linux can be easily installed as a dual boot system or on a virtual box as a virtual system on your laptop or PC. For instance, by downloading the system from ubuntu.com and then go to download overview. So there you have the choice of different versions of Ubuntu. And uh, the most common one is desktop, but you could also choose uh, Ubuntu Mate, which is um, might be more suitable for netbooks or laptops, or even the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, so if you downloaded it, you can burn it to a USB stick or also a CD-ROM or DVD, uh, and then start the installation for instance, by restarting the PC. So turn it off, insert the USB stick or the DVD-ROM, and then turn it on again. And while it boots, um, keep F2 and F12 or so constantly pressed. Depends on your computer, but it's usually one of those. And then you get into the boot menu. And in the boot menu, you can choose from which device to, to boot. And here you can choose start from USB if your Ubuntu system is on USB. And from there, it can install Ubuntu as a dual boot. So that means after restarting your computer again, uh, you can choose if you want to start into Windows or into Ubuntu. Yeah, alternative, you can also install Linux under VirtualBox on your PC or laptop or netbook, which is a virtual machine, which means a program which acts like a different computer. But this is somewhat more tricky to set up and needs more memory because it is shared with the host system. So here, for instance, you also need to um, install the, um, the host editions and uh, for microphone or camera, you need to activate them in the virtual um, box. So here's a short installation guide uh, which tells you how to set it up in case dual boot is not working for you. Right. So now um, to the scientific basics. So first, scientific literature work, right? So when reading papers, Check each information you deem as important by reading the corresponding references and check them by checking their references in turn until you reach the source of the information. So it's basically fact checking. 
For information that is claimed as original, meaning the authors invented it, um, you should do an internet search on similar resu results to see if it's true or how similar it is to existing results. Formulas are easy to check. For formulas we can simply check them by programming them or typing them into Python and see if um, the result is um, as they claim. So here you can see if you can reproduce the results presented in the paper. And often this uh, can be quite time consuming because um, they con or compare to some other methods, some known methods, and either you get a software for it or you need to program it. And that can, can take quite some time. But um, this is important, for instance, if you publish a paper, you have your own approach and you want to compare it to some existing approach, then you also need to take care of a good version of the comparing method. That it's a fair comparison, right? You need to compare your method to a good version of the comparison, comparison method. And that might also take some time to either get the software or to program it. Yeah, and if it turns out there is not enough information to reproduce the results, or the results differ significantly, then that's a bad sign. Yeah, it means there is something wrong. Right, so for your own paper writing, reference every information that you deem important or relevant to the source where you've got um, your information from. Right, so if you learn something from some other paper or book, then, and you use this information, you need to cite it. Otherwise, it's unfair. Right? You need to cite where you got your information from. It's um, unfair to the person. I mean, not citing would be unfair to the person who published it. But it's also unfair to the reader because the reader must assume it comes from you. And then if there's no reference, they don't know where you got it from. Right? So then for the reader, it's basically impossible to check. So that's why references are always important. It's for the ones who create the information and it's for the reader so that they know where it comes from. Yeah, so the, these references are also a currency um, of signs because scientists get their reputation from other people referencing them. Omitting them is like stealing or cheating. So if you are presenting algorithms or programs, um, present them in formulas or pseudocode or better in Python code in such a way that other people can reproduce your results, which is called reproducible research. Check your formulas by programming them yourself. This also shows you if you have a, if your formula is correct. Right? So that, this way you can see if they work. And if you get error messages or wrong results, this shows that your formula has a problem. So that's another advantage. Yeah, so in general, the goal of this course is to be able to solve problems in the area of multi-rate signal processing, like how to design sampling rate converters or filter banks, or even machine learning systems, which I show in the end. The approach that we take is to memorize only the most basic facts or properties, so memorization is still important, like the definition of the Z-transform, which you have to know by heart, and then know how to use them, like how to derive the Z-transform of a delayed signal. And this is the skill, and a skill you get by practice. Right? You have to do it um, for different problems, solve those different problems, and that develops a skill for you. And um, this skill is what you in, in the end need for your job later. Yeah, so as an engineer, we need to get something to work or function in the end. Engineering is also like applied physics, where we need the theory and then the experimental verification. So our test, if it works, is like the experimental ver verification for the uh, physicist. It is recommended to read the slides before a lecture, so the slides I'm showing you. Um, such that we can answer questions during the lecture and include the answers in the slides. And this is also why the slides will be kept in the editing mode. 
and actually this semester um, uh, we have the videos here and then um, I plan to have question and answer sessions <clears throat> in the last half hour of the regular time slot. Right, so we are, I will send um, around a link and then the last half hour of the regular um, time slot of our lecture will be the virtual question and answer session. So usually I would read each paragraph and then ask for questions, but in our online version you will just directly ask um, according to your notes that you made from watching the video or reading the slides. I will also show simple Python examples. So use your laptops um, such that you can try out these examples also. Right? Um, so when you're not in the class, um, you can do it during or after the lecture and see if everything works on your machine. And, and this way you can also make modification and try out things. So if, um, for instance, you might have a question, does it also work if I do this and this? Then you can just do it. Right? Um, modify the program and see what it does. And that's also a part of successful learning. You do your own experiments and see what happens. Right? And that's a major advantage of having those Python examples. <clears throat> and um, also this is part of acquiring a skill. If you are able to successfully modify a program that also teaches you how to write programs. Yeah, we also have um, course books. So first in English, Gilbert, uh, Gilbert Strang, Truang Nguyen, Wavelets and Filter Banks. This is a good reference. And a corresponding German book would be Fliege, Multiraten Signalver, Multiraten Signalverarbeitung, Theorie und Anwendung. Um, this would be uh, the German equivalent. Yeah, so lecturers, as opposed to pure electronic learning, have the advantage that we can talk to each other, and that is, uh, and that in this way the content can be tailored to your background. So you should ask questions, and also um, short discussions are beneficial, uh, beneficial in this way. So this part is what we will do in the questions and answer sessions. Okay, so let's start with multi-rate signal processing. What does it mean? First, multi rate. This means different sampling rates, as from using downsampling or upsampling in filter banks or also convolutional neural networks, for instance, for pattern recognition. We reduce the sampling rate after filtering a signal, which reduces the bandwidth. So, first, for instance, we apply a low pass filter, then we have less bandwidth and we can reduce the sampling rate accordingly, according to Nyquist theorem, right? For reconstruction and obtaining the original sampling rate, we need to upsample and filter for interpolation of the signal. So that's usual Nyquist. We can also increase the sampling rate. Um, and after increasing the sampling rate, we get spectral copies, and then we need to filter out has the correct original uh, band. So this is stuff you should already be familiar after EDSP, for instance. So where is multi signal processing used? For instance, encoding on compression algorithms like the so-called modified discrete cosine transform, short MDCT, filter bank in audio coding. So this is used in audio coding, or the discrete cosine transform, short DCT, in image and video coding. So both can be seen as filter banks and both um, have multi multiple sampling rates for compression and um, decompression. Yeah, also channel coding is an application, for instance, OFDM orthogonal frequency division multiplex, where each channel is divided into many narrower channels with, a lower, with lower data rates and hence longer symbol duration to reduce problems with multipath uh, and reflections. So there you would come with a high data rate binary stream. You give it to a synthesis filter bank and the synthesis filter bank 
then decomposes it into many narrow bands um, for a um, transmission over the um, channel. Right. Also, machine learning and deep neural networks, uh, which I show in the end, um, where you have the stride. So the stride is basically changing the sampling rate. And yeah, OFDM, maybe it's better to see it as having multiple bit streams. You come with a high bit rate stream, decompose it into multiple low bit rate stream, and then each low bit rate stream is then um, modulated on its own um, smaller carrier. So we have many carriers and these are then transmitted in parallel over the channel. So again, different rates. So here's an example of a discrete time signal, very simple. So here you can see the sample number and here you can see the sample value. So here's n and here's x of n. So this would be a typical uh, discrete time signal coming, for instance, from um, the audio card of your computer or from an audio CD. So on an audio CD, we have 44,100 samples per second. Or we also say we have a 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate. So kilohertz means thousand, so th 44,100 samples per second. Yeah, and here we have a little Python example for a live plot of a microphone signal using this program, which you can download from Moodle 2. So this is true for all the examples I show um, during the lecture. Those programs um, you can also download and you should download from Moodle 2 to try it out on your own. So they are intended for you to try on your own. So when I, everything that I show here in the lecture, you should also try on your laptop to see if you can get it run and maybe for own experiments. So let's see if that works. So I just copy and paste it in, into my terminal shell. So for it to let run, you need to open a terminal shell for instance, using the keys um, Control Alt T, or just go to um, um, the corresponding menu entry of your operating system and choose Terminal, and then you get a terminal window where you can just um, then type the command. So here, I'm typing the command Python. So Python is the command line interpreter which I'm, so I'm using Python 3. And well, let's try the first without. So if I'm just entering Python 3, it goes into the, com uh, into the command line option. And I can just type one plus two, and we get three. Or if you want to have the sign, S-I-N, I say import numpy as np. And then I can say np.sin because the sign is part of the NumPy library and say 3.14. Then you can see it's close to zero because 3.14 should be 180 degrees in radians. And you see it's not really zero because my 3.14 was just a coarse approximation. If I want to have more precise, I'm using the constant pi from the library NumPy. So now we get, you can see it's also not exactly zero, but almost, it's 10 to the minus 16. And it's 10 to the minus 16 because this is the computing accuracy of Python, the default computing accuracy. So if you see something 10 to the minus 16, you know it's basically zero, right? It's just rounding errors that appear here. Yeah, so this allows you to do some simple calculations or to try out a few lines of Python code. So in that, in that sense, it's, it's um, useful. I also like to use it as a pocket calculator, so it's very quick. Then you close it with quit as a function. So you need open and closing brackets here. I close it. 
So now I'm back at my terminal shell, which you can see at the different prompt. prompt. So here, three right arrows prompt means you're in Python mode. If you get the usual colorful prompt here from your terminal, you're back in the terminal mode. So now let's try my little program. And I'm not sure if the microphone is working because it's already in use for this video. Let's see. So, right. Ah, it's working. Great. So now you can see actually my live microphone signal. So you see my whistling really looks a little bit like the sinusoid, like it should. And my voice um, looks like a mixture of noise and uh, different sinusoids, um, as it should. Yeah, and here you can actually see how speech from um, your sound card from a microphone looks like. And here you can see the sample number. So in this window you can see thousand samples. I'm recording with 44,100 samples per second, as you can see here in the terminal window. And that means 1,000 sample is 1 44th second. So it's actually um, a fraction, tiny fraction of a second. Um, so a little bit more than uh, 20 milliseconds. So that shows that this is actually um, quite short duration. And that's also why it changes so fast. So I can close it again. Yeah, and here you can also see um, how you usually would execute a Python program. You just have the program name as argument for your command Python 3. So here Python 3 and the fir first argument is the program name that you want Python 3 to execute. Very convenient. And um, this also works on um, very small machines like Raspberry Pi or even embedded systems. Um, so that's uh, why it's so convenient. Um, so if, if you're using IDEs and integrated development um, environments, then it's often not so um, obvious. And um, if these are good for development itself, but if you want to really implement something in hardware, then those IDEs would be overkill. And then you really have to know how to let those Python um, programs run without an IDE. So this is. This shows you how to let uh, Python programs run without an IDE. And that's also why it's um, important um, that you do your homework um, or present your homework without an IDE. IDE is good in the beginning for development, but not for trying out your program. Okay. Yeah, also I'm using Python 3 because this is the version which is up to date by now. So Python 2 uh, in the meantime, is no longer supported uh, by the uh, community. So that's why I try to stick with Python 3 and any new development should be with Python 3. Okay. Oh yeah, we should take a look at the range, the value range. Let me try it again. Nope, that's not it. Oops. Where is it? Okay, copy paste. One, two, three. So here you can see the range, the value range goes from minus 20,000 to plus 20,000. And that has to do with the uh, um, internal number representation of those old audio samples. So let me close it. So um, audio samples are represented by 16-bit signed integers and 16-bit signed integers go from minus 32,000 to plus 32,000. And that's why we have this number range. Yeah, I just showed you this interactive mode. Yeah, and this sign function is part of the NumPy library and that's why if you don't have this np dot in front of it, you get an error because we first need to implement or import um, the library that contains the sign function. So this is what I did, which I already showed you. 
and as I mentioned this is basically zero it's just a rounding error yeah then back to the Nyquist theorem this tells us that our signal needs to be band limited to less than half the sampling frequency if we have 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate this means this is less than 22.05 kilohertz so half the sampling frequency is also called the Nyquist frequency so the Nyquist frequency is basically the upper limit of our useful audio range but it's not part of our useful um, audio range um, so useful frequencies and usually well below the Nyquist frequency for instance at uh, 20 kilohertz or 19 kilohertz yeah so for time discrete signals we only use normalized frequencies we normalize to the sampling frequency or the Nyquist frequency for the latter the normalized frequency of one would be the Nyquist frequency so if you normalize it to Nyquist then one is Nyquist also you often find pi as the Nyquist so then you would um, in this case you would normalize to um, the um, angular frequency or the angular sampling frequency type uh, 2 pi fs and if you normalize uh, every frequency to 2 pi fs then Nyquist is just pi yeah here's simple sample rate conversion example a sampling rate conversion of an audio signal from 44.1 kilohertz from a CD down to 32 kilohertz on the computer for instance the signal at 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate has all frequencies strictly below 22.05 kilohertz because of Nyquist the signal at 32 kilohertz sampling rate needs all frequencies strictly below 16 kilohertz right so here you see that doesn't match right and that's why before down sampling we have to remove this frequency range from 16 to 22.05 so we lose the highest frequency components from 16 to 22 kilohertz which is basically okay since human hearing is usually only to about 16 kilohertz right so except for the very young people uh, they won't hear any anything above 16. before downsampling we have to remove these highest these high frequency components by low pass filtering right, to ensure that Nyquist holds true then upsampling the other way around from 32 kilohertz to 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate observe here we obtain a new frequency range from 16 kilohertz to 22 kilohertz which should contain no signal components because we don't have anything there right uh, to begin with so here we have to low pass the upsample signal to these 16 kilohertz to make sure that there will be no alias components which you all know from ADSP so this up and down sampling are the basic building blocks of multi-rate signal processing the following picture shows the basic building blocks uh, for low pass filtering and down sampling by effect of N and upsampling by effect of n followed by low pass filtering so both required by Nyquist so here you can see the basic structure here you have the signal the audio signal at 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate for instance then you want to downsample it by some factor n and before you can do the downsampling we have to low pass the signal such that um, the low pass limits the frequency range to the new Nyquist frequency after down sampling so here you have the old sampling frequency after down sampling by n you have a new sampling uh, you have a new Nyquist frequency which is one nth of the old Nyquist frequency so you have to make sure that this low pass removes any, anything above one nth of the original Nyquist frequency so if this is a factor of two 
then this should only pass the lower half and um, attenuates or removes the upper half of the frequency half of the frequency range. For upsampling, we have the reverse process. First, we upsample by inserting zeros after each sample. For instance, when we have an upsampling by a factor of two, we insert one zero after each sample. And then we have this low pass filter again. Basically the same low pass we have in the beginning, we again have in the end. So since upsampling by a factor of n would basically double our um, available frequency range, and after upsampling we would get alias components in this upper frequency range, we need to remove those alias components by a low pass, which only passes the lower half of the frequency range. Right, to basically block um, the alias components. So this is convenient. We have the same low pass on both sides. So we just need to de um, design it once. If you have a good um, low pass filter for the analysis, it also works for the synthesis. Yeah, and we can do this downsampling and upsampling without loss of information meaning the reconstructed signal is identical to the low-pass signal if you obey the Shannon-Nyquist law. This means the low-pass, the LP, needs to be an ideal low-pass with normalized to the Nyquist frequency at the higher sampling rate, a cutoff frequency of 1 over n. <clears throat> so this is what I just said, right? except that Shannon-Nyquist um, um, assumes that we have an ideal low-pass, meaning Ideally, factor 1 in the pass band and factor 0 in the stop band, which is uh, not realizable. So it's an approximation, basically. In this way, we can perfectly reconstruct, ideally, the lowest one nth of our signal spectrum. But it's interesting to know. Example, we have an audio signal with a sampling rate of 32 kilohertz and hence an audio bandwidth of less than 16 kilohertz. For n equals 2, we low pass filter it down to 8 kilohertz. Right? So audio bandwidth originally 16 kilohertz. So 16 kilohertz is our old Nyquist frequency. Now we downsample it by a factor of 2, which means the Nyquist frequency is also halved by this factor of 2. That means we go from 16 kilohertz to 8 kilohertz as the new Nyquist frequency. Yeah, so this low pass filter needs to remove the frequencies at and above the new Nyquist frequency of 8 kilohertz. Yeah, and this at and above is also important because our filter needs to have a stop band which already starts at 8 kilohertz. So it's not like the end of the pass band but the beginning of the stop band. And this is important because we don't have ideal filters. Right? We only have filters which take some time from passing to stopping. So there will always be a transition band, transitioning from pass band to stop band. But we have to make sure that the stop band already begins at 16 kilohertz, which means the pass band ends clearly below 8 kilohertz. Yeah, so after we did that, we can downsample it by this factor of 2 by dropping every second sample. So we can do that because the signal is now sufficiently smooth if you look at it in the time domain. And in this way, we obtain an audio signal at a sampling rate of only 16 kilohertz instead of 32 kilohertz. So then we can upsample the audio signal back to 32 kilohertz by this factor of 2 by simply inserting, oh, that should be inserting a zero after each sample, which then produces alias components above this eight kilohertz. So no frequencies appear. And then we need to low pass filter the signal again with our low pass with cutoff frequency of eight kilohertz to remove these alias components. This results in the same audio signal with bandwidth of eight kilohertz but now at 32 kilohertz sampling rate. So now we can play it back at a different sampling rate. So the following picture 
shows a filter bank with critical sampling, which means its downsampling rate IN is identical to the number of subbands. It is the principal tool for multi-rate signal processing. And first we see the so-called analysis filter bank. So you can see it. Here again we have our input signal called X of N. And now instead of just using one low pass filter and the down sampler as we just saw, we use many filters. So here this would be the low pass filter, then you have band pass filters, and then you have a high pass filter here, all with the same bandwidth. Each filter has a bandwidth of one nth of the total bandwidth. So basically you can imagine that all those filters detail the entire frequency range. First comes the low pass, then the next band, just band pass, band pass, until we reach the high pass. So each of those outputs have a much lower bandwidth, one nth of the original bandwidth, and that's why we can downsample each of them by a factor of n, right? And that means even though we now have n subbands, we get the uh, same total number of samples because the sampling rate is only 1000th, for instance. If you have 1000 subbands and we downsample by a factor of 1000, then each of those sampling rates would be only 1000th, but since we have 1000 subbands, it all adds up to the same number of samples as we had in this input signal. Right. And also this has the advantage that we don't lose any frequencies. Remember in the case of a low pass alone, we lose the high frequencies. In this case, each frequency region has its own bandpass filter. And that means we don't lose any frequency ranges anymore. We cover, we cover the entire original frequency range. So the total information is kept. But also we have more samples here. Right? We don't lose any samples. We don't, in total, we, we have the same number of samples. So we don't lose any information, but we also keep all the frequencies. Yeah, so for each time step M, if you look at one time instance M, we obtain a spectrum when you look across the frequencies. So each subband means we have one frequency sample or frequency information. So this is basically one way to look at it. And for each subband, we obtain a narrow band with time signal. So if you just look at, instead of just looking one time step, we now look at one subband, so the other direction, then we have a narrow band time signal. So depending on our perspective, if you look at the time step or uh, the subbands, we have a set of spectra or a set of narrow band with time signals. So yes. And this is why we call this a time frequency representation, because we have both. We have the time information in the samples and the downsampled samples. And we also have the frequency information in the subbands. Each subband is a different frequency. So that's why it's called time frequency. Unlike um, the Fourier transform, for instance, you have a time signal, then you apply the Fourier transform, and then you have only frequencies, but no time information. This is kind of in the middle. Here we have the uh, our time signal, we apply the filter bank, and after the filter bank we have a reduced time resolution because of the downsampling, but we gain frequency in, uh, resolution through the subbands. And this makes it so important for coding um, time varying signals like audio or video. Yeah. So in our diagram, the filter boxes symbolize a convolution of the signal X with the impulse response. So you can also see it with uh, um, formulas which are put below here. So here those boxes are the filters and um, you do the filtering by convolution. So that's why here you can see um, the how the convolution is written as um, a sum. So here you can see it. We have this filter index L and it counts down the signal and it counts up um, the filter impulse response or the filter coefficients HK. 
and k here is the subband index. So basically this is the mathematical operation which appears at the output of each of those boxes. Then after this filtering we have this downsampling here by a factor of n and basically this just replaces this um, index lowercase n by this index lowercase m at the lower sampling rate. And since we do the downsampling, we instead of having this lowercase n, we have this m times n, the, and the downsampling factor, plus some offset n naught. So this n naught is between zero and capital N minus one. It basically gives the one of the possible sampling instances n. Uh, on, uh, so this, this n, n zero um, gives you basically the phase of the downsampling. Yeah, so the rest of this convolution equation is the same, except that we did this substitution here. And I introduced this notation down arrow n, which you can see here. So down arrow n means uh, we downsample uh, the version, the original version here, by the factor of n, and we do it at phase n naught. So this n naught here gives us the phase that we chose here. So using this notation, basically, um, this um, downsampling operation is fully defined. Yeah, so basically <clears throat> this equation here fully describes what's going on in um, our analysis filter bank, which you can see here. And um, the subband here is k. So k goes from 0 to n minus 1, capital N minus 1. <clears throat> and um, this lowercase m and lowercase n is as long as the signal is. Right, and we have filters here of length capital L. Yeah, so here we can see that for each time step, lowercase m, after downsampling, we obtain one spectrum at the output of the downsample subbands. Right. So for each m, we get n frequencies, capital N frequencies. And also for each subband, we obtain a narrow band with time signal, which is downsampled. So depending on our perspective, we have a set of spectra or we have a set of narrow band with time signals. Yeah, and that's why we call it time frequency representation. Yeah, so... As I just said, the filter boxes symbolize the convolution of the signal x with the impulse response h of n and the length l of each filter before downsampling leads us to this convolution equation. So this is what you just saw in the picture. The convolution here can be written by this convolution sum. Yeah, and the sum is assumed to go over only parts uh, where x of n and h of n are defined. So ideally um, x and h could be infinitely long, but still you would run over the non-zero parts. <coughs> yeah, downsampling by a factor of n means we replace lowercase n by m capital N plus n naught, as I just mentioned, uh, where m is the index at the lower sampling rate and, and not the phase index. So this is what you just saw. Here is this notation down arrow capital N and here our phase index and naught. Yeah, so the analysis filter bank decomposes the signal into different frequency bands. Observe that each frequency band has a lower sampling rate, which is possibly because they have a lower bandwidth Using the so-called bandwidth Nyquist theorem, we can we can reconstruct the original signal from the subbands if we assume that we have ideal filters. So here's the reconstruction, just like Nyquist will tell us. So again, here we come with a signal at the lower sampling rate. We upsample by inserting capital N minus one zeros after each sample. <clears throat> then we get the spectral copies which contain the alias components. And then we have here this low pass filter and here we have band pass filters and here we have a high pass filter. 
which are there basically to pass the right position of their corresponding subband. So here this would be the lowest subband, that means here this G0 needs to pass the lowest frequency. <clears throat> here in the middle we need to make sure that each G passes the corresponding frequency. Here this Gn minus 1 would be the high pass, which only passes the highest frequency. So at this point we have n signal streams at full bandwidth, but each containing only a small band of the original. So then we just need to add them together to get a complete full bandwidth signal. So here basically we are done in the end, and we call this signal here x hat, x hat of n. So here you can see the corresponding formulas. This x hat contains of the upsampled version of those n um, subbands here. And each of those upsampled versions, you can see it is basically a convolution of the upsampled version of our subband filter coming from the analysis filter bank. So here you can now see the notation up arrow n means we upsample the signal y by inserting n minus one zeros after each sample. And the zero is the phase index. So here we start actually right at the beginning of a new upsampling interval. K is the subband index here. So then at this point here, after this filter, we have the convolution of the upsampled version with the corresponding bandpass filter. So then we have K high sampling rate subband signals and finally we just add them all up to get the reconstructed signal. So if we really have ideal filters here, then Nyquist will tell us that we can get perfect reconstruction, that x hat should be identical to x except for some signal delay. And the signal delay would come from the filtering process, from the convolutions. Yeah, so this is what I just said. So we have the synthesis filter bank for the reconstruction. And you know, to simplify the notation, we drop the uh, down arrow and phase index for the subband signals yk of m. And observe the filters after the upsampling take on the role of the low pass filter in the conventional Nyquist theorem to block the alias components. Right? But here they fish out the correct frequency image out of the alias images for the subbands. It doesn't need to be the lowest, it can also be in the middle. All the subbands are then added up to reconstruct you know, the original signal. Yeah, so here's an example. We have a two-band system. That means we have capital N equals two. And our original sampling rate is 32 kilohertz again. Then the low-pass branch corresponds to our low-pass example above, which reconstructs the signal from zero to eight kilohertz. But now we also have a high pass branch, which in addition reconstructs the frequency range from 8 kHz to 60 kHz. Then we add the two subbands in the synthesis filter bank to obtain the full bandwidth signal from 0 to 16 kHz, so that we don't lose this upper frequency range. Yeah, and um, for we, we have a Python library called sound.py, which contains um, sound utilities, sound functions, uh, which you can download on Moodle 2. And uh, this is mostly for convenience, right? And this way you don't need to uh, know how to use, uh, or how to access precisely the sound card because everything is done within the functions of sound.py. But this needs um, software in the package SOX SOX, which um, needs to be installed from the software package manager under Linux. And you can use the com this command line for it sudo apt get install SOX. In the meantime, you, in the newer versions of Ubuntu, you can also drop this apt and it still works. 
So after uh, you did this installation, you can easily um, use our sound library. Yeah, this also shows how easy it is to install software and libraries in Linux. Just uh, one command line is enough to do it. Okay, yeah, and that's it for today. Um, thank you for your attention. Write down your questions and then we meet in the question and answer session. Bye-bye.